Welcome to session 351, where we will hear a paper presented by Denver Snuffer. Welcome to session 351, where we're going to hear a paper presented by Denver Snuffer entitled uh, Cutting Down the Tree of Life to Build a Wooden Bridge. It sounds like an interesting topic for all of us. Um, there will be a response by Dan Witherspoon after that. First of all, I've been asked to, in addition to welcoming you to this um, symposium. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, in addition to welcome you, I wanted to remind you to, that this session will be recorded. So if you could please silence your uh, cell phones. And um, also, I've been asked to invite you to attend uh, if, if you're interested in the book sales, because that helps support the symposium as well. Um, this symposium, this session, will be a presentation of a paper by Denver, a response by Dan Witherspoon. And um, if there's time at the end, which we anticipate there will be, there will be question and answer also. So let me get started so that we have time for our speakers. Uh, and introduce them briefly. Denver Snuffer is a practicing attorney who practices with the law firm of Nelson Snuffer, Dolly, and Paulson in Sandy, Utah. He's active in the Utah State Bar and has co-hosted two radio programs for a total of eight years, and in his spare time has written and published 14 books, most of them very lengthy. He is the father of nine children and resides in Sandy, Utah. Dan Witherspoon has a Ph.D. in religion from Claremont Graduate University with an emphasis in philosophy of religion and theology. He's a freelance writer, um, editor, and podcaster. He's the host of Mormon Matters Podcast, the former editor of Sunstone Magazine, and the executive director of Sunstone Education Foundation from 2001 to 2008, and is currently co-authoring a biography of Eugene England. He's the father of two children and resides in Bountiful, Utah. So we will first hear from Denver Snuffer, and then immediately thereafter we will hear from Dan Witherspoon. Thank you. Saturday afternoon. This is a paper that um, has some 160 footnotes. I'm not going to read any of the footnotes, and I'm not going to read all of the paper. I'm going to give you a, uh, an excerpt from the paper today, and then this evening when I return home from here, I'll put the entire paper up for anyone that wants it as a downloadable uh, online through my blog. There are four topics that are discussed in the paper. They are plural wives, ordination of black African men, pressure to ordain women, and same-sex marriage. The history of changing LDS doctrine, past, present, and the likely future are illustrated using these four subjects to show doctrinal changes required to build a necessary bridge between LDS Mormonism and the American public. Religion moves through two stages. In the first, God reveals himself to man. This is called restoration. It restores man to communion with God as it was once in the Garden of Eden. In the second, man attempts to worship God according to his latest visit. This stage is always characterized by scarcity and inadequacy. I can hear myself fine. <laughs> yeah. This second part is called apostasy because apostasy always follows restoration. Institutions cannot control God. As faith in God is institutionalized, it becomes part of this world and necessarily influenced by cultural, social, legal, and economic pressure. Those forces erode faith. Religious institutions are where the ideal comes into conflict with the less than ideal. LDS Mormonism illustrates this dynamic. Through compromises of its ideals, we see the, the pattern unfolding in our own lifetime. Joseph Smith bridged the gulf between man and God, and entered into God's presence again. Some few of us, myself included, believe his claim. I regard him the equal of Abraham, Moses, and Isaiah. But the various denominations claiming Joseph Smith as their founder again suffer scarcity and struggle to cope with God's silence. With time, all religious bodies confront the complex challenge of holding on to God's word. 
The ever-changing present causes cracks. Churches try to patch cracks. This leads to fractures. Then it leads to defections. Former believers either lose faith in the religion altogether or faith in the church. Without a restoration's abundance, pragmatic choices first become policy, then doctrine. God's silence does not curtail doctrine, but often compels it. After nearly a millennium and a half, there was a great gulf between God's last revelation and Catholic doctrines. When Gutenberg's 1439 press and an increasingly literate population made it impossible for the Roman hierarchy to control information, Catholicism fractured. The Internet is to LDS Mormonism what Gutenberg's press was to Catholicism. It is no longer possible for an institution to control the narrative. Catholicism attempted to regain control in two ways. First, the dogs of God, that's the nickname that was given to the Dominicans, were unleashed to confront heresy and suppress dissent. After two and a half centuries of pursuing this ill-advised course, the failure was recognized even in Rome. Pope Paul III reversed course and he launched the Counter-Reformation. A new order called the Society of Jesus, that is the Jesuits, was established at the Council of Trent to fo focus on needed reform. The LDS Church is following this pattern. Their first approach is to suppress dissent. The correlation infrastructure of the LDS Church has been put into place to protect doctrine and practice. An LDS group of Dominicans, the Strengthening the Members Committee, has been empowered to find and then remove perceived threats. Ironically, as will become apparent as we get into this paper, the original targets of the Strengthening the Members Committee were fundamentalist groups advocating the practice of plural marriage. At one time, this practice was the hallmark of orthodoxy for the LDS Church. The juxtaposition of advocacy first, followed by prohibition of plural marriages, illustrates a passage. Brash confidence in God's restoration makes the organization brave. Then faced with opposition, a quiet and distant God no longer fortifies the church. They appease the worldly forces of government and economics. From heaven's silence, men, men conjure doctrines they attribute to God. Plural marriage bespeaks this larger dynamic. Because LDS Mormonism has correlated a great deal of what it once was, has now been trimmed away. History and doctrine have been forgotten or rejected. By reworking history, the LDS Church has managed to brand even those who believe in Joseph Smith and accept the same scriptures as nevertheless apostate if they also challenge the newly correlated part truths. Within LDS Mormonism, a short memory is necessary to accept the history and the doctrine now taught. Long memories get its members into trouble. For LDS Mormonism, the Internet is a bastion of unsettling or unwanted information some of it is inaccurate, but the more effective challenges come from online sources telling the truth. When a false narrative is perpetuated by the institution and then confronted by truth, it's the institution ultimately that loses. At the moment to deal with this, the LDS Church uses search engine optimization, meaning the LDS Church pays money to have their site come up first on search engine results, this directs traffic to church-approved sources. LDS websites recount history designed to soothe the troubled saints, but it's not effective. All an inquirer need do is press through the first page or so of LDS church website referrals to locate independent sources. On their website, mormonchurch.org, the church states, plural wives, quote, was not mandatory and is not required for salvation, unquote. This is both true artfully using the term salvation, and false. It is true that plural wives is not necessary for salvation according to LDS Mormonism. But then again, neither is faith in Christ, repentance, baptism, or a good life. 
All are saved in Mormon theology other than the sons of perdition. Therefore, this LDS Church online assertion is true enough. But the LDS Church once claimed as a matter of doctrine, plural wives was an absolute requirement for exaltation. A reader lacking familiarity with LDS vocabulary will get the wrong impression. To those who are familiar with the vocabulary, this appears to be purposeful. Multiple wives' doctrine was so secretive during Joseph Smith's life that his wife could deny it was actually practiced. It was not until 1852 that the LDS Church publicly advocated belief in this form of marriage. The announcement caused national outrage. Abraham Lincoln's upstart Republican Party denounced it as one of the twin relics of barbarism, the other being slavery. Beginning with the Morrill Act signed by Lincoln in 1862, the full weight of national ire was brought to bear against the LDS Church. The dispute lasted three decades before the church surrendered. The final victory was achieved through the draconian measures imposed on the institution by the Edmunds Tucker Act. The act disincorporated the LDS Church and the Perpetual Immigrating Fund Company, giving their assets to the public school. It mandated an oath denouncing polygamy to be taken before anyone could vote, sit on a jury, or serve as a public official. It removed local judges who were LDS and replaced them with federally appointed judges certain to be anti-polygamy. The act rearranged family law. It required marriage licenses. It disinherited illegitimate children. It abrogated the spousal privilege that prevented wives from testifying against their husbands in polygamy prosecution cases. Although the LDS Church fought these laws through appeals to the U.S. Supreme Court, they lost the fight. Faced with the dire prospect of remaining an outlaw organization, the church relented. The struggle and surrender inform LDS conduct in ways that remain a part of the institutional psyche. We begin the story five years after Joseph Smith's death, when the doctrine of taking plural wives was first made public. Wisely, Joseph deliberately limited the practice and kept it secret. Personally, I believe that plural wives should never have been publicly adopted and preached. It was never essential to exaltation. Much of the content, when it was preached publicly, was based on advice Brigham Young received from a U.S. senator. To win protection under the First Amendment, it was necessary to portray plural wives as essential to the religion. But it was portrayed as salvific as part of a strategy to win in the courts. When the LDS Church lost the fight, they were faced with the conundrum of undoing an oversold doctrine. President Brigham Young asserted the practice was constitutionally protected if it was a fundamental part of Latter-day Saint religion. When he presided, he made plural wives essential to the church. He was encouraged in this view by an unnamed U.S. senator. The unidentified senator was likely Stephen A. Douglas, who had been elected to the uh, uh, United States Senate in 1846. They made it public in 1852. Mormon leaders defended the right to practice plural marriage as constitutional, delivered sermons for three decades to define the practice as a fundamental part of the religious beliefs. Young continually asserted it was both wholesome and constitutionally protected. When Orson Pratt gave the first talk announcing it publicly, the place he went first was constitutionality. He said, if it can be proven to a demonstration that Latter-day Saints have actually embraced as part and portion of their religion, the doctrine of plurality of wives, it is constitutional. Should there ever be laws enacted by this government to restrict them from the free exercise of this part of their religion, such laws must be unconstitutional. That's the first sermon in the, um, in the sequence. The month before this, Brigham Young made a similar comment. Quote, there is not a single constitution of any single state, much less the constitution of the federal government, that hinders a man from having two wives. And I defy all the lawyers of the United States to prove to the contrary. It would take three decades, but they did. 
President Young frequently declared this practice was essential. He claimed his sermons were as good as scripture and as couched in as good as scripture as is couched in this Bible. Taking him at his word, the following quotes show what the LDS Church believed during its second phase following Joseph Smith's death. Quote, now, if any of you will deny the plurality of wives and continue to do so, I promise you that you will be damned. The only men who become gods, even the sons of God, are those who enter into polygamy. Young priest, it was monogamy that was a great evil imposed by the Romans. Romans were a band of robbers who imposed monogamy to further the empire's lust for prostitution. But polygamy was, according to Young, the only religion practiced in heaven. The Romans imposed monogamy in order to produce an excess of unmarried women. And according to Young, this was responsible for prostitution and whoredom throughout the Christian world. Young warned women, young warned women that they risked servitude in eternity if they objected to their husbands taking plural wives in this life. They would serve those who live polygamy in this life. Who would be elevated to Godhood? Even speaking against plural wives could imperil your in eternal reward. Quote, those who spoke against the plurality of wives and in their feelings will not receive it, will never inherit the celestial kingdom of God, for it has always been practiced there and always will be. Plurality of wives was obligatory, not optional. If you rejected it, you were damned. Young absolutely rejected the idea of surrendering to the government. Doing so would be surrender to the devil. Polygamy was God's command and could not be disobeyed. Surrender to man's law was impossible because only God's law could save. Young called out the hypocrisy of the society condemning the saints. LDS women were wives and mothers. Congress was against that but tolerated adultery and illegitimacy. This doctrine was essential for the faithful to practice. Mormonism held forth the promise that man could become like God, but becoming gods in the afterlife demanded polygamy in the here and now. The only men who would qualify as sons of God were those whose quiver was filled with children produced by multiple women bearing offspring for him. Brigham Young died August 29, 1877, and was succeeded by John Taylor. When Taylor took over, LDS church history was more the product of Brigham Young than Joseph Smith. Smith led the church for 14 years, Young for 33. The doctrine of plural wives had become public and essential under Young. The doctrine of plurality of wives had become carved in stone. As the church's president, Taylor was just as emphatic about plural wives to qualify for exaltation. He had a full quiver of nine wives who bore him 34 children. Taylor preached it was apostasy to oppose polygamy. Facing federal prosecution under anti-polygamy legislation, Taylor spent the years of his presidency in hiding. He wrote a revelation on September 27, 1886, confirming to his mind the necessity of complying with the practice of plural wives. The revelation does not mention plural wives, but refers instead to the new and everlasting covenant, which he and Mormon fundamentalists regard necessarily to include plural wives. He died in exile, firmly defending the practice and preaching it must be continued. Taylor was succeeded by Wilford Woodruff, Likewise, a full-quivered polygamist, having seven wives or more, because our history leaves some of that open, and fathering 33 children. He was equally adamant, adamant about the indispensable practice of plural wives. Mormons would practice it come life or come death, he declared. Like Taylor before him, Woodruff wrote a revelation confirming polygamy was not to be abandoned. The document was read to the Twelve on December 19, 1899. First Presidency Secretary John Nuttall recall, recorded in his diary, quote, As I wrote at his dictation, I felt better all the time, and when I completed, I felt as light and joyous as it was possible to feel, for I was satisfied that President Woodruff had received the word of the Lord. 
Despite heaven urging them to continue, both society and the U.S. government were pulling in the opposite direction. Legal setbacks continued to accumulate. Reynolds versus United States upheld the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act, making it a federal crime to practice plural marriage. The polygamist uh, church leadership was guilty of a federal crime. Davis versus Beeson upheld the Idaho test oath designed to disqualify Mormons from jury duty and public office. The late corporation of the Mormon church versus United States upheld federal seizure of LDS church property. It was expected the government would take possession of all LDS temples. When the late corporation of the Mormon church decision was announced on May 19, 1890, a member of the Twelve Apostles recorded the internal reaction. By the provisions of the Edmunds Tucker Act, the property of the church was ordered as sheeted for the use of the public schools. In pursuance of this provision, some $750,000 worth of church property was seized and placed in the hands of a receiver. Events unfolded quickly once the church lost its property. U.S. Secretary of State James G. Blaine prepared a document on June the 12th for the church leaders to sign renouncing plural marriage. There's only one existing document referring to a pre-manifesto policy change. It was prepared two months before the manifesto. Abraham H. Cannon's diary records on July the 10th. He's, um, he was a member of the Quorum of the Twelve at the time. Quote, the resolution of the First Presidency of June 30, 90, in regard to plural marriage was read. It is to the effect that none shall be permitted to occur, even in Mexico, unless the contracting parties, or at least the female, has resolved to remain in that country. The church's worst fears were confirmed August 26, when the former federal receiver, Frank Dyer, related the U.S. would soon attempt Quote, to confiscate the Logan, Manti, and St. George temples on the grounds that they are not used for public worship. Keep those dates in mind now. Um, Woodruff got the revelation on December of 19, or excuse me, 1889. The decision was in May of um, uh, 1890, and in September, September 24th, Wilford Woodruff issued the press release now called the Manifesto, in which he denied plural marriages were taking place. The LDS Church would continue to practice plural marriages until a second manifesto issued by uh, President Joseph F. Smith in 1904. Plural marriages came into the LDS Church in secret before it became public. Likewise, it remained in secret after the 1890 manifesto, ultimately dying sometime after 1904. It is now denounced. And those who practice it are excommunicated. The LDS Church was finally motivated by popular disapproval and federal legislation to abandon plural wives. In a sacrament meeting of the First Presidency in the Twelve on April 2nd of 1891, President Woodruff defended the manifesto by claiming he had been, quote, inspired by God to issue the document, but polygamy would yet be restored in the church. Resistance to the popular will and federal legislation had proven impossible. The LDS Church would not have survived as a legal enterprise if their members could not vote, serve on juries, hold public office, if their temples were taken, their property is cheated to the government, and their officials jailed. There was no other choice if the church wanted to remain a corporate entity possessing property and practicing the religion. Polygamy had to go, or LDS Mormonism would be obliterated. The church chose to keep its corporate status and property. It wanted to continue as it had developed. Today, likewise, the LDS church wants to retain its tax preference, and it owns much more property than in 1890. A recent acquisition of property in Florida resulted in one newspaper headline, Mormon Church purchases 2% of the state of Florida for half a billion dollars. The likelihood of the LDS Church ever becoming embroiled in a similar battle of wills with the U.S. government is improbable. As it did in the past, the church will find some way to bridge the gulf between its, its teachings and governmental ire. 
It has much more at stake today than the estimated $750,000 taken at the time of the Edmunds Tucker Act. It would lose perhaps more than that weekly if the church's tax-exempt status were now revoked. Today, the LDS Church must be more nimble regarding public opinion than ever before because today it has more at risk than ever before. So we turn to the next subject, which is ordination of black Africans. Another abandoned LDS doctrine involves the status of black Africans. While welcomed as members, blacks were denied ordination. Brigham Young began, and other leaders echoed teachings relegating black Africans to doctrinally inferior status. Slavery in America began centuries before the United States. From the late 1400s, African slaves were transported to the Americas. By the end of the 19th century, there had been five times as many Africans brought to the Americans than Europeans. African slavery was a fact of life in the English English colonies before the American Revolution. Once the U.S. was independent, it had an economic infrastructure in which African slavery was a fact of life. Before considering or condemning the LDS Church's teachings, the larger social, legal, and economic setting should be remembered. Context is everything. In 1856, the Republican Party was formed in part to oppose the spread of slavery into the property that was acquired through the Mexican-American War. In 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court issued the Dred Scott decision. The ruling established that blacks, free or slave, had no citizenship rights and therefore no standing to sue in federal courts. January 16, 1852, Young explained to the Utah Territorial Legislature Africans were the seed of Cain and could not hold priesthood. He described them as black, uncouth, uncomely, disagreeable, wild, and unintelligent members of the human family. He did acknowledge them as members of the human family. (laughs) Any man having one drop of the seed of Cain in him cannot hold the priesthood. And if no other prophet ever spake it before, I will say it now in the name of Jesus Christ. I know it is true and others know it. The curse was not just to protect the right to priesthood, it was also to prevent intermarriage. Said Young, if the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. The nation fought the Civil War, but slavery was only concluded by the adoption of the 13th Amendment in 1865. To make the 13th Amendment a restriction on state conduct, the 14th Amendment was likewise adopted. The 14th Amendment says, No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The post-Civil War constitutional amendments were only the beginning of the process to establish equality for former slaves and their descendants. Segregation in post-Civil War America, was legal, having been approved by the United States Supreme Court. Although Brigham Young's comments about racial intermarriage seem offensive in 2014, the United States had widespread laws making such marriages illegal. They were referred to as anti-miscagenation statutes. It was not until 1948 that California became the first state to strike down such a statute, and it took the United States Supreme Court until 1967 to finally decide that in all states of the Union, interracial marriage could not be prohibited because that was unconstitutional. 1967. The Civil Rights Movement, the NAACP, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, the Civil Rights Act, all were required to change the status of descendants of former slaves in the American culture. While the civil rights movement was gaining momentum, LDS church leaders remained committed to preserve the racial teachings. Apostle Mark E. Peterson defended the church's position at a BYU audience of institute and seminary teachers in 1954 at BYU. He said, No person having the least particle of Negro blood can hold the priesthood. 
It does not matter if they are one-sixth Negro or 106. The curse of no priesthood is the same. If an individual who is entitled to the priesthood marries a Negro, the Lord has decreed that only spirits who are not eligible for the priesthood will come to that marriage as children. The question was so well settled that when LDS church leader Bruce R. McConkie assembled an encyclopedic summary of Mormon beliefs titled Mormon Doctrine, he could state with authority under the entry Negro this. The Negroes are not equal with other races where the receipt of certain spiritual blessings are concerned, particularly the priesthood and the temple blessings that flow therefrom. But this inequality is not of man's origin. It is the Lord's doing, is based upon his eternal laws of justice and grows out of the lack of spiritual valiance of those concerned in their first estate. The clear legal trends, however, were against discrimination. Institutional racial discrimination had been targeted by the civil rights organizations for years. As would be expected, the LDS Church came to the attention of the NAACP. Efforts were made to negotiate for a change. In 1963, the NAACP leadership attempted to meet with LDS church leaders, but the church refused. A meeting took place two years later in 1965. The LDS Church agreed in that meeting to support civil rights legislation pending in the Utah legislature. They agreed to publish an editorial in the Deseret News. The church failed to keep the agreement. First Presidency member Eldon Tanner explained, quote, we have decided to remain silent, unquote. By March of 1965, the NAACP took more public means to pressure the church. They organized an anti-discrimination march in Salt Lake City to protest the church's policies. The next year, the NAACP issued a statement criticizing the church, complaining it, quote, maintained a rigid and continuous segregation stand and has made no effort to counteract the, counteract the widespread discriminatory practices in education, in housing, in employment, and other areas of life. It's a really well lawyered statement because if you are discriminating in education, housing, unemployment, um, and other areas that are constitutionally um, prohibited from accomplishing, that attacks you indirectly rather than going at your religious beliefs directly. Brilliant piece of lawyering there. Although the institution was hesitating, its membership was increasingly willing to see more racial equality. The culture was changing, and change began to exert pressure inside the LDS church. In addition to the church itself, Brigham Young University offered a visible target for protest. The University of Texas at El Paso was confronted with a protest by their track team. After the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, black members of the uh, track team approached their coach and expressed their desire not to compete against Brigham Young University. When the coach disregarded their complaint, the athletes boycotted the meet, and that resulted in newspaper headlines. In 1969, members of the University of Wyoming football team intended to protest during a BYU football game by wearing black armbands. The protest was aborted when the university suspended the players. That resulted in litigation that went up through the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Stanford University suspended all athletic relationships with BYU in November of 1969. Legal pressure on this issue was reminiscent of earlier conflicts with the federal government. There were rumors the LDS Church faced a threat to remove its tax-exempt status. These rumors were denied by an LDS spokesman. However, the issue of racial discrimination was before the U.S. courts for years prior to the LDS policy change. Bob Jones University had a policy against interracial marriage. In order to enforce that policy, if you were a black student, they would admit you only if you were married. The Bob Jones University case was ultimately decided by the U.S. Supreme Court permitting the IRS to revoke tax-exempt status because of racial discrimination. A direct threat by the U.S. government would not have been necessary in the circumstances. 
The threat of taxation can ultimately destroy any institution, including the LDS Church. Chief Justice John Marshall coined the truism, the power to tax involves the power to destroy. Faced with the obvious national trend against institutional racism and with the memory of its past conflict with the U.S., the LDS Church changed its teaching June 8, 1978. Prior to this, efforts to make the change were unsuccessful because church leaders were unable to get approval from God. President Spencer W. Kimball turned the problem around. He wanted the change. He pondered it for months. He had a growing conviction that it would be a good thing to accomplish. He consulted carefully with the Twelve. He took their comments. He sought their advice. When the day came to decide the matter, he did not pray to have divine approval. Instead, he presumed it to be time for changing the church's policy and asked to be clearly told not to proceed if the Lord objected. Hearing no objection from the Twelve, his counselor, or heaven, the change was adopted. It was implemented in 1978, announced in official Declaration 2, now part of the Doctrine and Covenants. It's obvious the LDS Church could not admit forfeiting priesthood because African Americans are now ordained. It is equally obvious this change is incompatible with prior teaching. To bridge this gulf, the Church has issued a press release titled, Race and the Church, All Are Alike Unto God. The contradiction is accounted for by, quote, the absence of direct revelation, unquote, to guide the earlier church leaders. The return of scarcity is blamed. Quote, the origins of priesthood availability are not entirely clear. Some explanations with respect to this matter were made in the absence of direct revelation, and references to these explanations are sometimes cited in publications. These previous personal statements do not represent church doctrine. Unquote. This is the process. Scarcity forces the institution to substitute man's doctrinal innovations for God's voice. Restoration ends, apostasy begins. In addition to now denigrating earlier prophets, seers, and revelators for not having revelation to guide them, the LDS Church also unequivocally condemned them in a lengthy editorial on their LDS org website. None of these explanations is accepted today as the official doctrine of the church. Today the church disavows the theories advanced in the past. The black skin is a sign of divine dis disfavor or curse, or that it reflects actions in a premortal life, that mixed race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present in any form. They attribute their earlier missteps to U.S. history, including legal slavery, legalized slavery, when the LDS Church began. So, those are two things from the past. Now there's issues upon us at the moment. Homosexuality is a big issue. With some of the people in this room, about whom I care a great deal, it's an issue. It's a personal issue. Latter-day Saint history has surprisingly few teachings addressing homosexuality. It's a topic of only recent importance. There's a timeline published on the website No More Strangers LGBT Mormon Forum, which retells many of the events. The issue did not emerge into direct and regular discussion until the 1950s. Under traditional LDS doctrine recently articulated, Homosexuality is sinful, requiring repentance. In Spencer W. Kimball's book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, he wrote, The seriousness of the sin of homosexuality is equal to or greater than that of fornication or adultery, and that the Lord's church will as readily take action to disfellowship or excommunicate the unrepentant practicing homosexual as it will the unrepentant fornicator or adulterer. In a chapter titled Crime Against Nature, Spencer Kimball called it unnatural and wrong. He elaborated, all such deviations from normal, proper, heterosexual relationships. Boy, that, 
that reminds me of some of the church handbook of instruction stuff and, and admonitions from um, church office building to, to make stake presidents and bishops less inquisitive. All such deviations from normal, proper heterosexual relationships, and I suppose part of the definition of that would depend upon the gymnastic ability and the yoga practices of the couple involved, are not merely unnatural but wrong in the sight of God. Like adultery, incest, and bestiality, they carry the death penalty under the Mosaic Law. You know, as Latter-day Saints, sex is one of those subjects about which I think you're all gripping right now. My goodness, what's he going to say? <clears throat> well, uh, I'll keep that to myself. <laughs> A grim milestone was set in 1965 when five young Mormons, all homosexuals, all counseled by Spencer W. Kimball for homosexual sin, and all of them committed suicide. All of them were in their early 20s. Three had recently returned from missionary service. All had been BYU students. The year that these five suicides took place, let me read you from Ernest Wilkinson's devotional talk that he delivered in that same year. Quote, nor do we intend to admit to our campus any homosexuals. If any of you has this tendency and have not completely abandoned it, may I suggest that you leave the university immediately after this assembly? We do not want others on this campus to be contaminated by your presence. Well, in the United States, there is a tidal wave of legal activity on homosexual rights right now underway. Since 2003, every state has either legalized same-sex marriage or adopted laws prohibiting it. In Utah, an amendment was put on the November 2004 ballot. It passed with approximately 66% of the vote, favoring amendment to Article 1, Section 29, adding the following language to the Utah Constitution. Marriage consists only of the legal union between a man and a woman. No other domestic union, however denominated, may be recognized as a marriage or given the same or substantially equivalent effect. This took effect in January of 2005. It was declared unconstitutional in December of 2013 by the U.S. District Court here in Utah. Last month, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed that decision. Proposition 8 in California faced the same state electoral vote in November of 2008. The ballot fight was aided by LDS Church, providing both local, vocal support and assisting with door-to-door -door campaign er efforts. Before the vote was taken, church leaders David A. Bednar, Russell Nelson, Quentin Cook of the 12, Whitney Clayton of the 70, broadcast video into California urging church members to be involved in supporting Proposition 8. When the vote was counted, the LDS effort had proven decisive. Proposition was 8 was passed. Post-Proposition 8 statement from the LDS Church made this announcement. Quote, The Church expresses deep appreciation for the hard work and dedication of the many Latter-day Saints and others who supported the coalitions in efforts regarding these amendments. End quote. LDS opposition to Proposition 8 resulted in an organized effort to revoke the LDS Church's tax-exempt status. A website was established to instruct those willing to protest on how to approach removing the 501c3 status of the church. The protest focused on the Internal Revenue Code provision, which limited favorable tax treatment to institutions organized and operated exclusively for religious purposes and in which no part of the earnings um, and no substantial part of the activities involves carrying on propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation. The LDS Church has been publicly softening its position on homosexuality since winning Proposition 8 battle. The Boy Scouts' change to accept homosexuals was immediately approved by the LDS Church as a visible mea culpa. This is also true of others involved with Proposition 8. An LDS writer has advocated same-sex temple marriage in a popular Mormon journal. 
the Deseret News National um, Web issued an article on Friday saying that the IRS is now investigating political activity by churches. The LDS Church is necessarily attentive to legal trends. Its existence was once hanging by the thinnest of threads because of laws targeting it. Lawyers are consistently among the highest leadership of the LDS Church. The legal, economic, social environment in which the LDS Mormonism has evolved cannot be divorced from its evolving doctrine because many changes were adaptations to this environment. So we turn to women. When Joseph Smith was alive, women had limited property rights. When they married, their property became the property of their husbands under the common law doctrine. It wasn't until beginning in the 1840s that some states first began to modify the common law in order to protect women's property from their husbands or their husbands' creditors. Women's right to vote in the U.S. began in 1869 in Wyoming. They were allowed to serve on juries in Wyoming beginning that year. In 1893, Colorado let women vote. In 1896, Idaho and Utah did likewise. Keep this in mind because you live in a fundamentally different world than the world in which Mormonism began. The National Organization of Women was created in 1966 to pursue equal rights for women. The, L the ACLU announces on its website, 40 years ago, the American Civil Liberties Union Board of Directors determined that women's rights should be the organization's highest priority. They created the ACLU Women's Rights Project and named Ruth Bader Ginsburg as its first director. She's now on the United States Supreme Court. And the Women's Rights Project has won many landmark court decisions and achieved significant legislative successes. They've shifted public awareness and understanding of women's equality issues. The right to have contraception was determined in the Griswold case, written by Justice William O. Douglas, who wrote that the, the, the right was found in the penumbras and emanations of other rights that are enumerated. A penumbra is that, that hazy place between the lamp that's shining and the darkness beyond. It's just the gray area in between. That's where you find these rights. The innovation would produce another dramatic penumbral decision in Justice Blackmun's landmark abortion ruling eight years later. In the newly found constitutional penumbra, Justice Harry Blackmun found the right to privacy, also gave women the right to an abortion. Writing for a 7-2 majority in Roe versus Wade, he said, the right to privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty and restrictions on state action, as we feel it is, or as a district court determined in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people, is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate a pregnancy, unquote. At the time of the decision, all states limited abortion and the majority prohibited abortion altogether. The dissenting opinion of Justices Byron White and William Rehnquist lamented the majority exercised improvident and extravagant judicial power to fashion a new constitutional right. Whether it was improvident or not, the culture of the United States has been shaped by Roe v. Wade from 1973 to the present. At present, it is estimated over 56 million Americans do not live today having been aborted. The Holocaust was designed to target an unwanted population, and it's worked as it was intended. In 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court found that sexual harassment is a form of illegal job discrimination. In 1999, the Supreme Court ruled there were punitive dam damages available for sex discrimination. In 2009, President Obama signed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Restoration Act. In 2013, Defense Secretary Leon Panetta lifted the ban on women serving in combat rules, reversing the 1994 rule. All these larger national events affected views of Latter-day Saints. 
From imposing short haircuts on missionaries and BYU students, warning about hippies and drug use, advocating large families, not artificially limiting births, to denouncing rock and roll music. The LDS Church has been reactionary, trying to slow cultural changes. Whether viewed as progress or decay, LDS Church leaders have fought it. The Ordained Women Organization maintains a website in which Mormons are given a place to advocate change in LDS policy. They hope to end gender inequality by calling attention to the need for the ordination of Mormon women to the priesthood. The public's responded with numerous profiles pleading for change to LDS doctrine. The church responded through the Deseret News in an article on March 17, 2014, in an article titled, LDS Church, Aims of Ordained Women Detract from Dialogue. But the following month, in General Conference, Apostle Dallin H. Oaks gave a talk titled, The Keys of the Priesthood, The Keys and Authority of the Priesthood, in which he said, The Lord has directed that only men will be ordained to offices in the priesthood. But he added this, we are not accustomed to speaking of women having the authority of the priesthood in their church callings, but what other authority can it be? When a young, when a woman, young or old, is set apart to preach the gospel as a full-time missionary, she is given priesthood authority to perform a priesthood function. Whoever functions in an office or calling received from one who holds priesthood keys exercises key priesthood authority in performing her or his assigned duties. And so, according to Oaks, women can use the authority of the priesthood, though not necessarily ordained. Extending this reasoning to its logical conclusion, women will one day be able to baptize with authority borrowed from a male key holder. If institutional discrimination on the basis of sex ever threatens the LDS Church's tax-exempt status, this seminal general conference talk by a former justice on the Utah Supreme Court can be the basis to permit the first female bishop to serve using authority borrowed from a male key holder. In fact, under this paradigm, you really only need one guy, and everyone can function. Well, in conclusion, LDS Mormonism claims Joseph Smith as its founder. Joseph thought his restoration one day would revolutionize the world. It was a stone cut out of the mountains without hands that would roll forth and grind to dust all other institutions. Brigham Young thought one of the necessary obstacles needing grinding was the U.S. government. However, the LDS Church's history is filled with a contrary process. The U.S. culture has been grinding away at LDS Mormonism's peculiar doctrines and pushing it to conform with national cultural changes. It's not difficult to foresee how the present legal and social environment will influence future position changes on women's rights and more open acceptance of homosexuality. We should all expect that the church is going to do this. There are two possibilities to account for the LDS Church's history of compromise on their doctrine. The first possibility is these teachings, although once proclaimed to be fundamental, even necessary to obtain exaltation in the afterlife, were falsely portrayed in the first place. The Book of Mormon seems to support this view. That is, if you read what Christ announces as his doctrine, in that statement, Christ makes no mention of plural wives, priesthood, priesthood bans, or homosexuality. And Christ's admonition ends with, whoso shall declare more or less than this, and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil. Well, if this is so, then contrary to LDS past claims, no soul was ever damned by refusing to accept the doctrine of plural wives, nor was God going to take away all priesthood from the church as soon as the church attempted to ordain black African descendants, nor has Almighty banned women from the priesthood, nor is hom homosexuality a serious moral offense before God. God's silence led the LDS Church to oversell these teachings, and therefore they were and are free to correct them. The other possibility is that they got the doctrine right before, and by accommodating American legal and cultural demands, the LDS Mormonism has been cutting down the tree of life to build a wooden bridge. If this is the case, then popular will, federal legislation, and the U.S. Supreme Court 
will have more to say in the future about LDS Mormon doctrine than the churches, prophets, seers, and revelators. Just as they have exerted the primary influence after Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. Thank you. Denver's paper has presented a history of past doctrinal changes along with what he sees as potential changes currently trending within Mormonism. I don't have too much to argue with in terms of his presentation of the historical moments or the leader quotations he cites. I do, however, have great difficulty with the historical narrative that he has told them within, the selection of things to share or not share, and even more with the framing of his story. History. His story. Certainly it's a story of many people here. The world's going to hell in a handbasket, trending the wrong way. Go back to the source. I, I challenge that story here. His is a story that ultimately culminates in a huge false dichotomy, one that he sets up in the very title as well as the final lines of his paper. Either the teachings at the heart of these four areas he touched toward us through were falsely portrayed in the first place, or there are true revelations that Mormonism once got right but is now has compromised on, sold out for a mess of pottage. According to his tale, our tradition has and is cutting down the tree of life. Forget its fruit, he seems to say. We want its lumber. We want to put it to use towards a doomed project, accommodating with a fallen, to a fallen world. In presenting his tale and his dichotomy, he excludes a huge middle, with wonderful other possible framings for this history of change. Two choices are fine in a court of law, where one, those involved must decide guilt or innocence. Deductive logic can be helpful at times, but the coherence of a case falls apart when there are substantive challenges to the premises one's built from. In my response today, I offer an alternative vision that I believe challenges this foundation, and in doing so, offers a far more satisfying and capable way of framing the same ground that he has covered. First, however, where he and I agree. For anyone who's heard my podcast for you know, even maybe six or seven episodes, or has engaged with me in conversation for a long time, you've probably heard me talk about a favorite metaphor and framing for the, the power and the fire that is at the base of any uh, revelation that kind of starts a church or, or that activates us in our hearts. It's from the Franciscan uh, father, David Stendhal Ross. He talks about God's revelation be like, being like when you receive that, you're in the, the midst of the churning volcano. It's active. It's going. It's full. It is chaos. But as it erupts and as it flows over the sides, we, we start to see it to begin to cool. It's molten lava that is running down the sides, things like that. But clearly, you can still see the fire within it. You can see its origins. By the time it gets down to the bottom and a bit of time after the eruption, what is it? It's simply cooled rock. Very, very difficult to see what's there. Stephen Carter, the current editor of Sunstone, also helped to personalize this with me a few years ago, and he talks about our personal spiritual experiences. When we have them, when we are in those modes of wonderful, um, you know, enlightenment, you know, almost out of body, we're soaring with open hearts, and, and everything's coming to us all at once. We have that experience. But guess what? Soon we begin to say, I don't know what to make of this. And we begin to start to tell a story about that experience. You know, maybe we're going to share it with our friend. Man, you just can't believe it. I'm so expanded here. And I can't even convey it to you, but it was kind of like this. And you begin to, to tell a story. You begin to tell a part. You begin to tell a part. And then pretty soon, guess what? Fast and testimony meeting rolls around. <laughs> and you get up to tell that thing, and by then you've nailed it down to just one or two lessons from that story. So from the fire, from the expansiveness and things like this, we begin to quiet, to tame, to cool that story. And then from that point on, unless we do what I think Denver and I both agree, 
And I would hope most of us here agree here, unless we continually go back and mine it for something new and things like this, we're going to forever only interact with that story by those two or three things that we decided to tell in fast and testimony meaning. For the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, that will be the moment of our experience instead of going back again and again to do that. So where he and I absolutely agree is when you get institutions involved <laughs> with their own needs and with their own ends that they must serve and things like this, absolutely, it's a barrier to our direct experience with God, with our direct hearing uh, from the divine source. So we're 100% agree with that. And as I wrote down here, um, and even I shared with him in, a, in an email, I said, you know, I really wish that you simply would have asserted this. <laughs> you know, instead of this long history in these four areas, in the good, simply assert a script, or institutions get in our way. They, they screw up that thing. There's another layer between us and God and this need to do it. Because if we could then, you know, to have just simply asserted, we could have gotten to the more interesting things. How does God actually work with us in our lives? That's what I hope that perhaps my conversation will prompt as you guys come up here. Certainly there are layers of his paper that I'm not addressing here at all. Okay. Uh, now back to text, sorry. <laughs> I am far less certain than Denver that our societal trends, trends, including and even especially the four areas that he discussed today, are the result of a large-scale failure to hear God's voice, to feel God's spirit. As Francis Bacon once reserved, God has two, observed, God has two books, the book of his word, scripture, and the book of his works, nature. We must read them both. Societies are comprised of individuals And God works with individuals. Individuals interact with information from science and observations from nature and their own encounters with it and with other people and with what is new and is challenging. And they weigh it out and we weigh it out in many deeply spiritual ways. God not only works and teaches us through direct wowie, zowie revelation uh, to either ourselves or his designated prophets. The pronouncements of scripture and ancient prophets are not things that we can fully and for all time base our understandings of God and God's working upon. As Adam Miller wrote recently, God works with whatever small knowledge of the world we've already got. He speaks to people in their weakness and after the manner of their language that they might come to an understanding. You'll recognize that from DNC 1. Our sacred texts witness God's willingness to suffer this weakness. They tell of a mix of stories from many different times and places that illustrate what happens when the strength of God's polyphonic voice gets funneled into the weakness of our mono-channel ears. Miller speaks of the importance of not trying to harmonize Scripture, to pretend that there are voice, that voices there do not agree with others. Scripture, he says, is best to meet rough, as uncut, For it is in this form that they bear witness to real revelations given to real people because they also bear witness to the host of real weaknesses that can help socket God's world into their worlds. Our plural marriage, withholding of priesthood from those of certain races and sexes, and full honor of relationship status to those via biology, our same sect attracted, really things that we want to hang our hats on is eternal? Are they tree of life stuff? I thought tree of life stuff was the love of God. It's never to exclude. Is the tree of life stuff sad? It only communicated in face-to-face direct revelations from God to us, to our prophets. Can it also be even more reliably available to us in our ongoing and ever unfolding experiences of love, in our relationship with family and friends, in meeting someone and coming to know them such that their divinity and absolute worth and blessedness reveal themselves to us in ways that we had previously never imagined. Revelations of God in such form are Denver's excluded middle. We are presented with new information, new persons, and experiences. We do fresh dives into the holy fire and we yield to its burnings. Of course, not everyone does this in a disciplined way or with full consciousness of what they are doing. And they certainly do not do it at the same time or at the same speed. But I read the ultimate story of life and Mormonism, contra to Denver's narrative, as one of a dance, 
of ascension, not fall, of expansion, a widening of moral concern, of growth into greater relationship with all of God's creation, and especially each other. As described by the philosopher Hegel's powerful framing, at each and every moment we have active theses and antithesis, antitheses, at play. Denver's examples, he actually left out some things of hippie culture and free love and illustrating the types of excess that we learn from. Um, but basically, the things that so many people, when they kind of present the going to hell in a handbasket thing as excesses and things to avoid, you know, you could call them the antithesis, antithesis or whatever you'd like to do. But my assertion is that they are, are among our most powerful teachers. They are essential as well, that we bounce off. You know, when the, when the new idea comes out there, we bounce off the rough parts. Um, I am just recently think always when the church talks about, you know, John Dillon's website and Kate Kelly and stuff is leading people away from the church. To me, the blogger NACA with its free for all is absolutely saving folks, especially in those voices that are so negative, so strong, so I'm fed up here. They, they teach us what we don't want to be, how we don't want to to be in that pain anymore and things like that, just as much as they influence people out, I think. Um, I'm, of course, botched where I'm at, so uh, hopefully this will pick up with some kind of transition. Uh, Although it is halting and frustrating at time with painful lessons, with many growing pains, I trust us. I trust our human hearts. I trust that we're all susceptible to the influence of the Spirit as we find ourselves faced with new questions and experiences. I trust that we are, as Paul urged, proving all things, and though it's ultimately haltingly and with frustrating setbacks, whether it's sexual or other forms of excess or ugly inspired pronouncements for those who should be prophets, we are holding fast to that which is good. What we are seeing in both church and society is a dialectic of creative advance that is far from a compromise of ideals. Even as many ancients and we in our day have come to taste the fruit of the tree of life, we must understand that it is a tree that never stops growing. Each taste can and should be fresh, far more delightful than each past bite because our senses are now better honed. And as the creative advance of the divine is showing us even more wonderfully, it is a tree that has ever-growing new varieties of delightful fruits. Many here testify of the envelopment of spirit as we meet and honor and love persons in depth, persons of all races and sexes, who in the, and who in our encounter with them bring all of their experiences. In the hugeness of their hearts and the fierceness of their efforts to understand the fullness of sexual identity, along with every other aspect of what it means to be a divine being in human bodies, our gay, lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, and intersex brothers and sisters serve us as teachers and prophets. From then we understand even more of creation's richness, diversity, and goodness. As we strive to love more deeply in our relationships with our husbands and wives, whether same or opposite sex as us, God is made manifest. Our hearts swell as we meet women whose gifts of hard-won wisdom and leadership have been allowed to flourish. We soar with the angels and we receive the ministry of black men and the blessings from their priesthood hands and in sitting and learning at their feet. Soon we will know this and even more sweetness and fullness of joy with our sisters as well. And the angel said unto Nephi, Knowest thou the meaning of the tree which thy father saw? And I answered him, saying, Yea, it is the love of God which sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. Wherefore, it is the most desirable above all other things. And he spake unto me, saying, Yea, and the most joyous to the soul. Two verses later, it is compared to a fountain of living waters. I testify that it is one, of, it is one that is shedding itself abroad in the hearts of all of us as we meet and ponder the meaning of all that God is showing us. The stirrings and one-on-one -on -one changes of heart and mind in these same four areas that Denver bemoans as compromise are revelations, as sure as any received by Abraham, Isaiah, or Joseph Smith. We, individuals, society, Mormonism, are on a journey that is anything but a fall. Thanks.
We do have time for questions, so I get to make up the rules, and I also get to amend them if I decide they weren't the best rules at the beginning. Um, so what we will do, if those of you that are interested in asking a question, if you'd like to line up over here by this wall, and then this will be on deck in the chair, and there's the microphone, and I will call on the first one, and then they will be able to ask at the microphone the question. Um, it can be asked of one or both of them, and I'd like to ask our, our um, Denver Snuffer and Dan Witherspoon to keep their responses to two minutes. I know that's concise, but it seems like we might have more than one or two questions, and that would be helpful. So you look like you're ready to ask the first question. I'll let you go microphone ahead. microphone working? Yes. Okay. This is Dan, uh, Tim Malone. Dan, thank you for focusing on the fruit of the tree of life. I was looking for that in Denver's remarks, but let me ask this question of, of Denver, actually. My takeaway is that you stated that the LDS Church has changed fundamental doctrine, is changing, and will continue to change because of submission to social and governmental pressure for fear of losing tax status. Is that a correct takeaway? Um. The definition of fundamental doctrine is not something that I apply to the church. It's what the church has advocated on its own. I'm contrasting what the church said at one time was fundamental doctrine with what it has done to abrogate, denounce, renounce, and even condemn unequivocally <laughs> out of their own mouth, a prior practice. The motivation for accomplishing that transition was the focus of the paper. I'm not trying to make a moral judgment. I'm trying to understand the events against the backdrop of why the events took place, not when they said it, were they right or wrong, but when they said it, and they said it with the in the name of Jesus Christ comment, Brigham Young, I read, and I read that on purpose because he was stating, I'm telling you this in my status as a prophet of God. I'm telling you this in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you this will never change. And it's changed. And now the church, after making the change, has turned around and said, we unequivocally condemn that. Now, that's the purpose of the paper. And the purpose of the paper is also to highlight the fact that institutionally, this is the problem. The problem is that truth and, and love and purity does exist, but it exists primarily in a form that is non-institutional. According to the scriptures, one of the criticisms that was made about the paper was this false dichotomy. According to the scriptures, there is only two ways. There are, save two churches only. And one church, if it's going to subject itself to institutional control, the vagaries of the law, the pressure of the tax code, everything else, that church will necessarily become sullied and soiled, tossed and pulled, and ultimately wind up contradicting itself. There is another church, and I agree that that church can remain pure, unsullied, untouched, untaxed, unregulated. That purity can exist in your heart. That purity can be found between you and God. You. I think any institution is going to suffer the exactly the same history. Anyway. Thank you. Um, my question is... Um, if the fruit of the tree of life is not available to homosexuals and to women, once they're embraced within the church, what will they find instead? I don't agree with that, that they're denied, or they should be denied. The, 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 problem, um, the problem addressed in the paper and the turf on which I feel very comfortable discussing is the problem of um, 
church doctrine, legal pressure, fundamental positions being taken as if they were out of God's mouth itself, and then contradicted later to illustrate the problem of the institution. I don't think, I don't think that I can or ever should have looked for institutional approval for my relationship with God. There was a time I did. There was a time I cared a great deal about that. But the institution has rendered that now an impossibility because I I can't serve within the church. That hasn't done a thing to deter my conviction, my relationship, my fidelity to God. Likewise, I think in every individual's life, this world is a terrible place, and this world is a wonderful place. It is precisely wonderful because it is so terrible. It doesn't matter what circumstances you find yourself in. Everything down here is going to pull away at you. Eventually, everything's going to wear out, break down. There are going to be disappointments. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be disagreements and arguments. The comfort that you find, like Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail, you know, peace, my son. This is only going to be a small moment. And if you endure it well, you're going to be rewarded on high. I don't think that an institution can embrace with love everyone because some of us hate some others of us and the institution would like to love us all. And those who get control get to use the bully pulpit for their purposes. And those that don't have it get to resent it. I don't think ultimately the fix will be institutional. I think it will be personal and I think it will be individual. And I think there will be a gathering, and that gathering will be called Zion, and it will happen because the prophecies foretell it. But I don't think it's going to be after the fashion of something you can regulate or uh, take control of, because any time you manage to get control, you, you wind up in politics and economics. In his fear of institutions, again, I, I argue, you know, I, I asserted the same sort of thing. But I don't want to lose the fact that it's important that we work these things out in community with each other. So the fact that we have an institution that provides the buildings, that provides some of the structures in which we meet and, 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 and you know, interact with each other and learn from each other, to me, shouldn't be outweighed simply by this. But again, I think both of us would be in agreement that no matter what's said there, it's you and your relationship with God. It's you and the fire yourself that has to be able to drive it, to not be, you know, just simply interacting with it so far down the mountain to where it's cool that you can hardly even uh, tell what's there. So I just wanted to shout out that I do think this is important to work out. Whatever God, the primary actors in in the world are not institutions. The primary actors in the world are, are people. And we're complex. And we go forward and we go backwards and we halt and we run fast and and we stumble and all these different things. But when I see an institution changing the way the Mormon church is, even though it's frustrating, they're not changing anywhere near the directions I want. And when they say stupid things that just make me want to go crazy or something like that, I still see it as an advance because we as people are advancing. We are meeting each other. We are learning from each other. We're engaging sciences. We're understanding what's going on And this is sure revelation. This is sure revelation, simply unfolding in just a messier way. So, again, I want us to get together as often as possible. I think we can learn a lot from the, uh, the community process of discussing all that, but, but that's, that's not revelation. Um, it, well, my question is how... Um, nowadays, we, it seems like uh, the... the, you know, the, the What's they said in uh, Nephi said that the, the deep sleep or the tears have to never that kind of thing. Yeah, um, step into the yeah. mic. Oh, sorry. So, uh, anyway, my question is um, you know, usually the best we can do when it comes to personal revelation, whether it's you know, lay members or, or leaders, is is a, a yes or no magic eight ball kind of a thing. <laughs> and, and I'm not you know, denigrating that. That's, that's, I'll take whatever I can get, but how do we move from that to actually getting a complete sentence out of the Lord? <laughs> you go ahead. 
I, I don't think it's I don't think the Lord speaks in sentences. You know, we, you know, seriously. I mean, every ex- powerful spiritual experience I've had has been so overwhelming, so much bigger, so much beyond any kind of language or things like that. It's the downhill. It's the explaining it to you, to my friend, to my congregation or something is where we put the words on it. And that's why it's so important to go back and constantly do the dive. And so, you know, to think that, you know, I, I honor Isaiah. I honor, you know, Abraham and the people. In fact, you left out a few references to some of the prophets that you really admired. Um, I admire them because they're examples to us of Joseph Smith of going straight to the Lord, of having that face-to-face relationship the way Adam, you know, Genesis describes had with God in the garden. So I'm, I'm, I'm with all, I guess I've just lost my train of thought, but I'm with, I'm with that process, but I'm with it all the time. And just as I don't accept the, the cosmology of a flat earth sitting on waters below, a firmament held up by the pillars of heaven, I don't accept Abraham's uh, pronouncements on cosmology. I don't, I don't feel the need to, you know, to, to honor everything that they say. I honor their interaction with God and, and try to look at that as a model for my own life and, and want us, even in an institutional setting, to all remember this. We've got to go straight to the source. You know, I was raised by a Baptist mother and got Bible verses read at me every morning before we went to school throughout childhood. When Mormon missionaries came and told me about the Joseph Smith story, and when Mormon missionaries assured me that Joseph saw God and that if you follow James 1.5 and you ask God, he'll give you an answer, and if you will pray about the Book of Mormon, God will make it known to you whether it's true or not. I accepted, I was young still, I was still a teenager, I accepted that as literal. I I accepted that as possible. I had... Faith that that could happen. I'm not a theologian. I do believe God not only talks in sentences, but can um, make himself known to man. Literally. I believe all that. I believe that God did appear to Joseph. I believe that he did appear to Isaiah. Having that understanding... I did not think there was anything unusual when an angel appeared to me. Because an angel did appear to me. I thought that was the normal, usual, everyday way that Mormon religion was practiced. I thought everyone, sitting in a ward as a young teenager, looking out at all these all these experienced Mormons listening to the general authorities, I thought they all were talking to God in the temple every Thursday. I thought this was common, ordinary. It took a long time. I I presume that was what everyone walked around with. It took a long time before I mentioned anything about any of the experiences that I had had before I realized that's not usual. That's not normal. That's not customary. And so, I'm trying to make it usual. I'm trying to make it customary. I'm trying to say, yes, God's real. Because if I have seen him, I think you can see him and ought to. I think everyone should make the fiery ascent to God's presence. I think it should not be limited to an occasional here or an occasional there. I think we should have an abundance of witnesses and the prophecy that Moroni spoke to Joseph Smith that the time is going to come when no one needs to say to anyone else, Know ye the Lord, for they shall all know him, needs to be fulfilled. It's lying dormant. Amen. And I would say... principle that uh, go to it yourself, you're going to go with your symbol system. You're going to go with your expectations. A Buddhist will never go and have the experience with the angel, with Jesus, and things like that. What Denver is having is not the same experience as what Heschel has, what Muhammad has, what Hafiz had, what Latza had, and things like this. So when we talk about whether God speaks in senses, what language does he speak in? He speaks in the systems 
of ours that open up to this sort of level of presence, but it is not, you know, a deep dive through okay. one symbol system is wonderful, and it's pretty hard to get out of it, but I think we need to stay aware that there's so many other people diving and meeting God, meeting the divine in so many other different ways that, you know, I honor Den- Denver's experience, um, but I, I can't limit God to the to the symbol system that simply, you know, we hold in Mormonism or... Or wider. I'm, I'm, I'm with Mormonism's expansive views that simply say truth and God is working everywhere. This much I know. The angel said, on the first day of the third month, in nine years, your ministry will begin. And so you must prepare. Those were the words. I can quote him still. He spoke. He spoke in a sentence. My question is, I hope I'm not big enough, the more all of these situations are going on, I feel so strongly, more and more, I just keep getting it, that this is all about unity, and it's an opportunity for us. And if unity is about agreeing, then frankly, God did a terrible job. And so, so the more and more I'm seeing all of this, what I keep coming to is the quest for Zion seems to me the quest for open-heartedness mm-hmm. and charity and unity. And so when I, in my family, in my community, you know, when I see one side that says a gay person, an actively gay person will never come into the presence of God or a gay person will go to hell, you know. And then on the other side, I see a person who is an active Mormon or a person who doesn't approve of homosexuality is an awful person and is a hater. And I see those two things. And and I see Christians saying Mormons are going to hell. And I say all of this. It seems to me that the more we dig our feet in and say, I'm right, and I'm trying to push this agenda in my discussion, we're working away from God and away from Zion. And more and more, I think that if we can say, this is where I am, and because of my experiences, which are such and such, this is what I believe, and let me hear where you are and what you believe, and let's talk and consider, and let's go, I think that that's great, and I, even though I disagree with you and I may think you're wrong, I trust God to lead you to what is right, and I trust the atonement of Christ, which is my theology, to take care of whatever you've got wrong, just like I trust that for me. And I I, I think that I believe truth exists, but I think when we all know all truth, we'll all agree. And in the meantime, we're trying to find our way there. So my question is, first of all, is that possible? I mean, do you do you agree? You know, I guess I especially. I, I agree. Okay. I agree very much. In, yeah, in the first book I wrote, I said religion was in, intended to be applied internally only. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So now, and then, and then my other question is, you know, like my theology. I'll come out like my theology that I what I have find in the scriptures on the issue of our day, homosexuality, is that I believe that homosexuals are a gift to us to teach us great things. I'm, I think we need to learn charity. I also believe that God does have a standard. But um, I want to know if those two things can coexist. Can people hear me say, I truly love you. I'm thankful for you. I embrace you. I accept you. But this is my theology and morality. Can we be in this place where we can love each other with our differences instead of seeking agreement. Can we seek unity without seeking agreement? You know, um, I grew up in a little town in Idaho. Um, Homosexuality in the 1960s was almost a non-existent issue. However, there was a restaurant in Mountain Home, Idaho, that was owned by a gay man and his, I don't know, boyfriend. They they lived together Um, everyone knew that they were funny. They were comfortable living in a community that was full of a bunch of retired military and active duty military people in Idaho in the 1960s where I suppose they were just as Republican there then as they are in Idaho now. Um, It was known. It was not talked about. I mean, there might be a passing reference that was it. Um, I worked at those guys' restaurant. It's one of my first jobs. I washed dishes in a restaurant owned by a gay fellow and his and his live-in lover. Um, it was no big deal. There was no politics involved. There was no agitating on the issue. 
Um, one of my law school classmates is here. Um, he wound up on a drive to Idaho with a fellow who announced that he was gay and attracted to the man. It was one of those awkward moments. Um, he came back. We kind of chuckled about that. The fact of the matter is that both he and I had um, business relationships with that fellow. It was essentially a non-event. It was strange. It was, you know, thanks but no. I think we ought to be ginger about the way in which we deal with one another's weaknesses and problems. I think we ought to be firm in what we believe and apply it rigorously internally and then have compassion on every idiot you're going to meet because we are all idiots, myself included. I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you too, um, but I'm, I'm, I don't need those answers very fast at all. I'm completely willing to live in tension with that. I, where, you, where you pushed a little bit too far to me is I love you, I love you, but these are my standards or this is that. To me, I'm willing to simply say I'm going to hear you, I'm going to be with you, I'm going to see your light as, as much as you'll show to me and things like this also without, without kind of trying to have a resolution. When I talked about the Hegelian di- dialectic, it is a, it's a process and I'm completely fine with it taking forever in my own heart. Uh, or Can I have one last? I'm sorry. Oh, you know what? We're out of time. Thank you. Thank you um, to Dan Krishnoffer and Dan Witherspoon. So.